Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just as a, I guess, uh, give you a bit of background. Last week was the uh, Ref 2012 conference in Sydney, and that's basically the key event, um, event in the remote labs, remote engineering type domain. And we have um, um, Gustavo here now as, as one of the eminent scholars in that area. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, he's, he's been working in the area for, for 10 years. If you read anything about remote labs, his name keeps popping up. And, and there's a fairly small circle of, of very active researchers in the field, and Gustavo is definitely one of them. I'm, I'm quite happy to have him here today and, and talk about his experience in the domain. Thanks, Anna. Thanks. So, welcome. I, I just hope that we can enjoy this time together because this, although this is video and all that stuff, I just want this to be quite informal. So, whenever you have a question and you know something, just feel free to interrupt. And I want this more to be a kind of dialogue instead of you know a formal presentation because we have a lot of that. So it's I want to learn from you, okay? And I want your input in the sense of how can we actually improve remote labs, how we can actually get remote labs into the mainstream of education. So whenever you have a question, a doubt, or you know, a reflection, please interrupt me. So the title of the presentation is A, a Few Personal Stories on Remote Labs Research and Development. I put this title because I wanted to make it informal. So the, the word stories, okay? So it's not a, it's structured in the sense that I've used a timeline to write this uh, presentation, to prepare it. But it's not structured in, structured in the way that there is, a, you know, a focus, an area, a question to be answered. That's not there, okay? Um, I'm from the Polytechnic of Porto, School of Engineering, and I'm happy to be with you at the USQ in Toowoomba, Australia. Just a, a minor comment here. Why am I here? Um, I got the chance to review a paper um, to EDCOM. EDCOM is one big conference in engineering education. And this paper was from this university. And I got to know the project you had here about the use of remote labs in, involving many faculties. And I said, yeah, this is the way to go. This is what, this is my speech, this is music. So I just wrote, a review and it happened to be to Alexander that later on I, I knew this. But I said, if I have the chance, I'll go there. So I was, as I was coming to write, I said, okay, I'll go there. So that's one of the reasons why I'm here, okay? And that's the first thing. I have to say, <coughs> you have a good job here. You have a good project. That's the right direction to go. Involve faculty, involve different universities, different faculties into the use of remote labs, okay? But we'll, We'll talk more about that during the process. So, I started working in 2000 in remote labs, okay? And this is 2013, and we'll just go through here and see what, what I have done in, in, during that, that time. Just, just a few things before. My PhD thesis that I've done through, from 95 to 99, it was on the, microelectronics, um, designed for debug and test using the 1149.1 and the P1149.4 infrastructures. This very microelectronics, electronic stuff, okay? At that time, there was not much thing in terms of training, uh, you know, training models for that. So we had these projects, European projects called ASTEP, and the Insight running on. I will talk about this. And then, after the project, after my PhD, there were two major projects starting. And this was a, a point in my life where I had to take a decision. So I took a decision there. I'll talk a little about that later on. So, first of all, that was my PhD thesis. One important aspect there was my supervisor, a person called Jose Ferreira. He was one of the active persons in remote labs right from the beginning of the REV. He was the organizer of REV in Porto in 2007. So he had a lot of connections and he has some very 
interesting and important work in the in remote labs as the the Moodle the Moodle booking models things like that. So it's important. I'm going to acknowledge because it was very important for the the period that I, I had after the PhD. Now, at that time I was also work while I was doing my PhD working on this project called uh, Leonardo Insight to Integrated Small Electronics Industry Goalie Directed Eye Technology Training. So we were actually producing content materials for uh, what is uh, boundary scan, what is debug, things like that. So we were more focused on the, the technology, teaching technology. Very, we didn't know too much about this learning outcomes, things like that, because we were really talking to people that were on the edge of technology. Okay, so the, 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 it was more about the things we had to, to teach about. Okay, we had companies like Ericsson, uh, University of Oslo, Sintef, Sensanur, ADD, many companies working on this. Now, at the same time, we also had this advanced software for teaching and evaluation of process. And this was for the, also funded, it began in 98. And here, we were starting to use learning management systems for actually delivering the contents. At that time, we used WebCT. I don't know if WebCT is still in there. Not anymore. Not anymore, anyway. So we did a lot of work there, you know, preparing the models for delivering this. Um, that was the time when we started, okay, this has to be structured, we need the frequent ask questions, all that stuff. So we started to enter into this educational language, okay? So, but there was one thing missing. Is that we used real electronics. We, we, I had to go with one board with me when I had, for instance, when I had to when I had to deliver a course in Scotland, I took the, the, the hardware with me and, you know, just to make the hands on. Okay, let's control this and do that. So, everything was migrated, being migrated into the learning management systems, the contents, but not the real hardware. So, what you do? Is a remote experiment. You allow people to access the hardware from the place where they are. So remote labs and remote experimentation came as a solution to a problem. It, this was a real problem, okay? So at this time, we, we were pushing these boundaries more, design for debug and test, Allegro cursor, Allegro stands for a lifelong education and training environment for microelectronics. So you see the moving, from a step and the inside. And remote access to our board. You could control and it could seal the result with a, a webcam. So this was back in 2000. Okay. By that time, <coughs> Jose had worked with a person from a, um, the Open University of the UK, a guy called Martin Cooper. Martin Cooper was at Robert Gordon, at the, I think it's Robert Gordon University. He went into Open University. We had a, a few projects before in the early 90s on the access of people with the special needs to technology, you know, elderly people. So we had a pretty good relation. And at that time, when Martin went to the Open University, he invited Jose to join this uh, proposal, which then was accepted, called Practical Experimentation by Accessible, Accessible in the sense for people with the, you know, special needs, remote learning. So uh, all the ingredients were there. So this was involving the Open University of the, the UK. It was involving the University of Dundee in Scotland. It was involving the Trinity College in Dublin, the Zenon, it was a robotics company in Greece, and we are at the time the University of Porto. So the proposal was roughly at the end of 99. This was approved and then started in 2000. And this was the turning point because when I finished my PhD in 99, 
I have a decision to take. What do I do now? So I was teaching at the Polytechnic of Porto, which was a different institution from the university. My supervisor, Jose, was from the university. I had two children by then. My, my daughter, she, bore, she was born in 93, and my, my boy in 96, and my PhD in 99. And I said, what do I want to do? Do I start my own group? Do I, you know, it's time to get your wings? And I said, if I do this now, I will never have the chance to have more children. Yeah, it's, it's the way it is, you know, because I, I knew it's, it, it, once you start your own group, it's like hell. You know? I mean, so I said, okay, I will work with my supervisor for some more time. I will take the time with my wife, you know, we'll go home a bit earlier. Don't feel the stress, the responsibility, because then Joseph will be doing that part. He will be the, the leader. And then I said, okay. And eventually, there was the time, the opportunity, and my son got born in January 2002. Great! <laughs> so, you see, it's the point where you actually see family, science, teaching, it's, it's, it's a balance in there, you know? So, I'm in remote class because not that I say, oh, this is the thing I want to do, but eventually because I wanted to have another, another child. So, you see, things happen like this. Right, what will we do in the Pearl Project? David Lowe mentioned that this was a failed attempt to share remote platform. Remember this, he said that during the rev, and I said, oh, come on, David, wait a minute because it was not the point about sharing remote labs. The different institutions had different views towards what they wanted regarding remote experimentation. For instance, the Open University of the UK, they wanted real simple experiments for supporting their online courses on physics. Things they will be using robots to automate the thing, to see the flame, a spectrometer, things like that, you know to support physics courses. The Trinity College in Dublin, they wanted to put an XI table for doing visual inspection of printed circuit boards, you know, for looking into faults, pan, tilt, zoom in, things like that, soldering problems. There was their aim. The University of Dundee in Scotland they wanted to put a, a remote electron scope, um, micro electron, uh, electroscope, yeah, uh, into online because they have this biology curve, things like that. And we, at the University of Porto, we wanted to put these uh, boards that emulated the 1149.4 infrastructure, the 1149.1 infrastructure, online. So we actually discretized the whole infrastructure. We put some lights so that students could see, or people, the trainees could see the internal state of switches, things like that, okay? And we were using top technology at the time. We were really on the edge of things at that time. To give you some ideas, we were using a PXI system. We were using a boundary scan controller from Gopal, which is a German uh, company. And that, at that time, we were interacting with the company and asking them to change the DLL just to support some functions that we would like to use to support these training models. The other thing was that we were using um, LabVIEW at the time. Now, LabVIEW, uh, you could actually control the VI panels. VI panels will be the virtual instruments panels remotely. But then the client will, will need to install a plugin at his machine or the return machine. And the plugin was quite cumbersome. I mean, it would be something like 30 megabytes. It would not run on all operating platforms. It would use additional ports other than the 8080 HTML. So there was a lot of problems. And there was this company called Nascimento where they developed an application where you could develop the 
Applet Java's counterparts of VIs. So you will be accessing the VIs through Applet Java's in the client's computer. No plugins, no additional ports, and we were using back, we were beta testers of their applications. So we were really doing research on this. Okay? Eventually, National Instruments bought the company and they stopped you know, doing that. And that's the thing with the, com with the industry and companies. You do research, but then in the end, you are not in control of things. Okay? And so we could actually access these control webcams. We are also embedding the communication tools because in 2000, Skype was not uh, very popular at the time. I, was there Skype at, um, in 2000? I don't oh, think so, it's no. It's a I don't think it was in. Yeah. We were using a thing called CUCME. Mm -hmm. Okay? And at that time, we need to be one important aspect of this uh, project because we're doing this research, top level research, was that we were in close contact with the IT guys at the University of Porto. So for instance, the person that was responsible by the firewall of the whole university, and he was my, he was my colleague. So I said, come on, Sergio, I need this. And he went to his office. Oh, here you are. Because the CUC me needed to clear up, to open a few ports, because it, the server was installed at the university. And when you have these personal relations, everything is it's oiled, you know, it's swift, you can do everything. If you don't have the collaboration from the IT department, what? Forget it. You, 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 you can do a few nice things, but then if you don't actually support them. So it's very important. This is one critical aspect that I learned then. Remote labs need the support of the IT department. Period. As simple as that. Okay? Skype was 2003. What? Skype, 2003. Okay. <laughs> so, by then there was crossing roads. Oh, my, my mind was a, com a completely mess at the time. I had another project with uh, the use of boundary scan, led by a company called Critical Software. We were doing fault injections. We were working with the European Space Agency because this was, you know, technology side. And at the same time, there was a call for the Alpha program. Alpha means Latin America Academic Cooperation. And uh, Jose said, he called me, it was a morning on, on September. He said to me, hi, how are you? There is this call, call uh, ending at the end of October. Do you want to put the proposal, you lead it? And it took me three seconds. Yeah, okay, I'll do it. At that time, he had been working with many in, uh, universities in Latin America and in Europe too. So his idea was to kind of mount a, a network of universities for sharing remote labs, for talking about remote labs. And the other thing was that by then in 2003, my son was born and I said, okay, it's very unlikely that I will get, my, I and my wife, we want to have four children, but I said, it will be difficult. We were, you know, age comes and then you say, well, the energy is not so much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I was slowly moving my research activities from the University of Porto to the Polytechnic of Porto, where I was a lecturer. And by that time, I also had supervised the Ricardo's master thesis on the PER project. So this was on, on remote labs. So this was a turning moment. Um, eventually, we got lucky, and uh, this proposal was approved. It was accepted. But then I was starting to collaborate more with Brazil. Um, this was one presentation I made in San Salvador da Bahia, in Brazil, which is roughly here, the Amazon will be, Amazon will be here. 
There's one slide here that I, later on, if you want, I can show you that it's because you also have this faculty of nursing here. I was using something from, from that side. So, but the main point was the alpha proposal was accepted. And the name of the proposal was Remote Experimentation Network, RexNet. And here, this was our vision of what remote labs would be at the time. Remote labs, from, for us, should be something like an inter-university, peer-to-peer, e-service. It's a service. It's an electronic service. But it's academia. You need the social connections because you will have teachers from different universities using your remote lab and you want to trust these guys. You want to tell them, okay, you can use my rig. Go ahead. Because you know they will take care of it. You know, They will be using it for teaching purposes. So it's a peer-to-peer. -peer. And it's a service in the way that you should maintain this. You don't want your fellow over there, you know, your colleague, using this and then all of a sudden it breaks. And he, oh, come on, Gustavo, my students need to use this, please. So there should be a level of service there. In the same way that, for instance, USQ here, you have Moodle. If Moodle breaks during the weekend, you got guys in the IT department running or doing something remotely to actually put it online again. Because they're the ones that break. They're the ones that break. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that was the whole idea. It was quite a large network. We had uh, initially 10 universities. Uh, so we were coordinating that, the Polytechnic of Porto. They were uh, mainly doing the management part uh, and the scientific coordination. The technical coordination was done by the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil with the group of uh, Professor João Bosco, called the Rex Lab. And we had the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, the Catholic University of Santiago de Chile, and the Catholic University of Temuco in Chile too, the Technical University of Berlin, and the University of Porto with Jose, the University of Dandy, University of Bremen, Technological de Monterrey in Mexico with Eric Zucker. And roughly th this was the, 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 the initials group. Then later on, I was trying to extend the group, and we included the, the, open, the Polytechnic University of Catalonia, Catalonia in Spain, University of Deusto, Javier's group, which is also very strong in women's clubs, and also the Southern University of Santa Catarina. So we were enlarging the group. There were a lot of things happening there, and there was robotics, there were access to in industrial plants, like the two-couple two tanks experiment, was with the Carlos Pereira group. So, I mean, lots of things being done, you know. Um, and the group started discussing a very important question at the time. And that was, what does, what do remote labs bring into education? What is the added value? Why should we use remote labs in education? That was the main question we identified at the time. Any ideas? Why are remote labs useful for education? What do they bring? <coughs> They're useful for us because we've got students all over the world and they can access equipment which would otherwise be left idle for long periods of time. And for the students, it's good? Well, feedback from the students in most cases is fairly positive, yeah. You but then have to ask what do labs bring to education, remote or otherwise? Yes. You have to take some learning objectives around it and do it properly. If you just threw labs out there, then what's the point? So you're saying that because your university has a number of uh, you know, students that are not on campus, remote labs are a way for them to acquire experimental skills, or actually doing the experimental part. Provided those activities are properly structured. Mm. How do you know that? That's one of the things we're doing research and development on, what we need to do to properly structure them. But yeah. 
we've got an idea of what we need for online learning because of our 80% of our students are distance anyway. But uh, we need to work out, do we need some peer mentoring around it? So uh, lots and lots of questions around that that we're working on now. So you still think that there's research needed there? Yes. Right? I agree with you. I agree, totally. Can I comment? Yes, so. From my own experience, I felt students touching the real apparatus have better understanding than just clicking on buttons. Because some of my experiments, I, run, I used to run normally. They moved it to RAM, and I don't see them. They can, uh, they click this, they don't know what's happening behind. Oh. And that's an issue. Oh, In I my opinion, that you lose that touch of the real world, controlling what's happening by just clicking on something that's electronically working in some way, you don't know how accurate, okay. how, what is the performance, linear or nonlinear or what. You have no knowledge from okay. behind. Let me try to understand. Not given, okay. not given to the student anyway. What labs do you usually use? Fluid mechanics lab. Fluid mechanics. Okay. Can your students use the lab 24 hours a day? Can they use the lab whenever they want? If they want, but... If they want, they can? Why not? It's open? The lab is not, is not uh, completely used all the time. No. So you have supporting staff there? Okay. They For could. us, how we run it... I, I know the point you are getting. No, no, yeah. the, no the thing is... There's a moment when people, when students perceive things. That will not be exactly the moment the class is running on the lab. You know? And when you want to create knowledge, to understand things, this is directed, controlled by the student. It's not controlled by you. You see my point? Is that if you have your, your lab open and it's you know, doing his uh, lab assignment or lab script or lab report at the res residential hall, you know? No, I can't go there. I, I, I need new data. This is not correct. I'm willing to take them back to the lab. Okay, but I mean, it's correct. But I, I see the benefit, but all what I'm saying, comparing it, to when you have the machine running manual and RAM, I feel they have better understanding and control than the RAM. That's my comment. I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. But I, I have two comments there. One comment is the sort of competence you are looking for, you know, do they manipulate the instruments, they, you know, touch, they understand, they see it. It's a bit different from the understanding that they will get from the remote lab. Okay, you are looking to slightly different type of competencies. Okay, one remark. The other thing, and that's a very common, I will say mistake, sorry, is that remote labs, is, they are not a replacement for the hands-on lab. And that's what I was It's not a replacement. I totally Don't agree with you. change mine to rent. And I lost the real one. Completely agree with you. I mean, Thanks. you are 100% correct. And, and this goes in the line of what Carissa Bose, she was one of the pioneers in remote labs, say. It's a disservice to promote remote labs as a, a, a replacement for hands-on lab. And it's a disservice. You will save money because it's... A and especially we get the students from everywhere, especially for that week to do it here. And the ones who are being transferred to RAL, they broke the, the original normal one and we can't have it. Okay. So it doesn't, like, it, it defeated the purpose, as I say. But story. imagine that the student can opt for, you know, he has both things. He has the opportunity to go into the lab, but whenever he wants, he can also remote access it. Do you think is this better? I agree that, okay, okay I can use the RAL in not in a prep course, in just a learning. Okay, look into the variation of the pressure in that pipe. Look, the result itself would be the useful, not how you run it. But if it is a prep course, it should be by hand. That's what I see okay. the difference here. So 
that's coming to this discussion. You see, different teachers, different faculties, different pro professors will use remote labs in different manners. But the main point is, it's different from having a choice or having no choice at all. One worry is that to some extent, the remote lab is a status symbol. Very often you can devise an experiment, they can do it in their own home. If they're measuring transistor parameters, they're doing stuff on our Arduino, they're looking at bubbles, say, the sort of negative bubbles that you can create and things yeah. of that sort. You can devise really simple experiments that they can play with at home and get the same insight into the way that uh, physics behaves. But you have to have a remote lab as a status symbol. It yeah. has to be something that you're providing to the students rather than sending them to the hobby shop. Yeah, and I mean, the, with a remote lab, you have access to an oscilloscope, a power supply, a, a, a yeah. signal generator, which you don't normally you have at, at your room, right? If they've got a PC and an Arduino costing 30 bucks, yeah. they have an oscilloscope. Yeah, you're right. You're right on that. There's, a, there's a, actually ways of turning that. Sorry, really, you um, Looking at the educational perspective of your comments, I'm thinking, what I'm thinking is if I'm designing the RAL, then I have to be very aware of the outcome I'm intending to get. And if it's the control, the physical control, then a click button interface to me is the wrong interface to get that skill remotely. Mm. So having even a dial or something that represents it more um, accurately or has more feedback about um, that particular aspect because to me the learning design and the interface are mismatched. If when they walk into the lab they snap that thing first time then the design of the interface hasn't dealt with that particular aspect of the learning, whatever the learning is that you want out of it. So that if you want them to be able to walk up to the physical machine then your simulation is wrong. And it's like putting a pilot in the simulator and when he gets in the real plane, he crashes it every time because he just goes slam on the power because he's used to going click and, and he gets the right amount of power because the computer simulation said one click equals exactly the right amount of power instead of one click means one degree. Yeah. Two clicks means two degrees. Yeah. Five clicks means five degrees. So I think there's an element of the design that could be modified to improve the learning, but it, it's you have to know what the learning is before. And I think a constant iterative cycle in the design and refinement is another element of, like you say, you must have yeah. you must have the IT support. I think you must have iterative review so that you don't use a bad lab over and over. Yeah. That you say this is an element we need to fix. Yeah. because the learning isn't working. And I think the other aspect to it is how you use the labs, because I mean, we're ultimately you're talking about automating experiments of some sort, and I think in mm. our environment you can think of, of three uses. One is the residential schools or the prax practice classes, which are blocked per week. The other one, or, or, or starts a semester every week. The other one is, is where you, you teach an academic course and, and routes activities can be used then to integrate it either in, in, as part of your your class or you can send the students after class there and say have another look that's a real thing that's a practical experiment and then third use was to for students to do an assignment you know so they've done an academic course and as part of the academic course they have to solve some problems and use the route the experiment mm -hmm. interface to, to address that mm -hmm. and i guess that then has to be linked to the potential learning outcomes and what you can achieve. Well, I think there's a philosophical aspect. Uh, you need to think in terms of telepresence. You need to bring the student remotely to the lab rather than try and take the lab remotely to the student. In other words, you need to give them the experience of being in the lab mm -hmm. with whatever communication yeah. you need. I see it can actually work on both, both directions because, for instance, one thing is you expose the, the, the student to the real lab first mm -hmm. and they say, oh, okay, this is what I'll be controlling from home, you know, they know, they see it, this is the place, mm -hmm. okay? The other thing, and I had this experience, I had a, 
I teach elect electricity to students that are in mechanical engineering, automotive, and the number of blown fuse I have at the end of semester, it's because they take the ammeter, oh, let me see if this is, uh, has power in here. You know? And they will go like this. Because for them, it's mechanical. If I, now, my direction is, I will first teach them how to use the remote lab, okay, so they can get an idea of what can happen if they just go with an inter and put it there. So it can be used on the other way around, okay? The best combination? Oh, it will depend on the, the subject, the teacher, the methodology, the learning. It's, it's, but it's not one direction. It's both directions, okay? Now, the other thing, just, uh, just taking your comment, is that there are research lines on the use of haptic devices to give that kind of feedback you wanted. For instance, you are with a, an automobile, you know, a car, and you want to see if this, there is pressure in this tube, you know, okay? You press the tube and you see if, there, if it is open, the, the circuit or not, from the first feedback you get. You want students to get this kind of knowledge, right? In fluids mechanics, I will say this is important. I imagine students can do that with an haptic device. Teresa Rustilius is doing that with a, for measuring the youngest models, you know this? It is the, the resistance of a material. So there are research lines on that aspect, haptic devices, to get the real feedback from things you are actually remotely accessing. Okay? You need a high bandwidth, perhaps. You need that, and, and also the kind of haptic device. You can have the real good ones, you can have the, you know, the cheaper ones. It, and this is mechanics, this is not my field, but the force they, they give to you, there's, there are differences in this, okay? So there's ongoing research on this, okay? I've seen some of the work that Ananda presented with the Connect, co connect interface yeah, has the potential yeah, to be yeah. another yeah. interface. You know, because you can actually, um, in 3D, put your hand on a thing, you can move it, and you, you actually, the amount of movement is like turning a dial, a dial or, a ga uh, or a wheel or something. So I think really well-programmed Connect could actually help with that, because haptic is much more expensive, it's hard it's to get out to yeah. your students. Now all students have a haptic yeah, device, because can be, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, Connect is, is a way to to do some of that simulation if you had a good interface. Yeah, definitely, great. Okay, so, Rexnet went from 2005 to 2006. There was a lot of things happening. These were crazy times at the time. Uh, we had uh, the kickoff meeting from Indianapolis. I went to present the, this um, project at ETFA. This is a, a conference organized by e, IFAC, you know IFAC, International Federation of Automation and Control. Any members of IFAC here? No? No from the Automation and Control? Long ago. You were long ago? Back in 64. Yeah, it's, a, it's an old, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very, but it's very respected IFAC, you know that. Okay. That's where I met Javier Garcia Zubia from the University of Deusto. Javier now has a a very strong group of remote labs called the Web Lab Dilsto. Pablo and Nacho were here at REV. He organized REV last year in Bilbao. We had the meeting in Bremen and then in Berlin. We went to see the Max Planck Institute. And these guys in Germany, they, well, they have everything in terms of technology. They have the money, they have the expertise. They have, it was really nice to be there. They had this um, online distillation column where they will be making the distillation of methanol. Yeah? And the, all of this was online. They could actually control the parameters. There's a lot of uh, webcams, you know. They could do this. And this was back in 2000 and 2005. So there were a lot of research, things being done at the time. I went to Online Educa. Online Educa was the major one of it's one of the major conferences in terms of uh, LNS things like that online education. It's a huge conference. I met Michael Hauer there. It was in December two thousand and five. Michael Hauer is the president of the International Association for Online Engineering. He's a very is actually the IAO is the organizer of, of REF. It's their conference. 
REF in Maribor, in Slovenia, International Meeting on Professional Remote Laboratories Bilbao, organized by Javier. That's where I met Ingvar Gustafsson from BTH. Ingvar Gustafsson started developing the Vizier system in 1999. It's probably the most used remote lab for electronics and electrical circuits teaching. Okay? As a, a huge, it's not a huge, but as a, a large consortium of institutions that have Vizier nodes. We have the Open University of uh, uh, the Spanish Open University, uh, the University of Deusto, the Karinti Institute of Applied Science, there is one node in India. So there's a lot of people already sharing this remote lab, sharing. And the, the pace just kept increasing. Um, I went to this conference in Habana, Cuba, uh, also organized by IFAC. From Habana, I went to Sao Paulo, to Surinopolis directly, to be on the examination board of Suarez and uh, PhD thesis. There's a, a lot of things going down. It. The, our Alpha project was distinguished as one of the best 50 Alpha projects. There were something like 300 Alpha projects uh, funded by the Alpha program. Um, another project I had, and at that time, Javier edited a book called Advances on Remote Laboratories and the E-Learning Experience. And he put on the, on the front, the front uh, part of the book, an equation that I wrote on the, on the board like this, you know, when we were at this conference in, in, uh, in Catania in 2005. And that was the answer, the, my answer to the question, what is the added value of remote experimentation to education and in education? And he put it, Gustavo's theorem. Actually, I couldn't give an answer to this. I don't know the added value. But in my view, the added value was a simple equation. It was the difference between the educational value and the costs of having or supporting remote labs. So, I didn't, the added value was the difference between these two things, the cost and the benefits. Whatever the added value is, if you increase the educational value and if you decrease the cost, the added value will grow. You don't know what is the value, the added value, but you want to make it bigger. So you increase the educational value of remote labs. Why? You do group work with foreign students, you share good pedagogical experience, things like that. You work on that. Let's improve this. What about the costs? You share equipment, you sh reuse software, you share things. At the end, the added value will be better. It will grow. Although we don't know, until the moment, I don't think that we are capable of actually measuring it and say, this is the added value. It's here, it's quantifiable. It's this amount. Okay, so when things start running too, too really, really fast, what you get? You get... I was completely blown by this, all this activity. So, my family met the desert. It was many, many proposals we wrote for, you know, for funding schemes. Inotio, Sola, Be Aware, Rexy Edu, Daedalus, Free Cell, Remote, all of this love gene. A lot of work. Nothing came. Nothing. Time and time and time I was spent preparing all these proposals. Nothing. I mean, it's, it's like remote labs were no longer, you know, important or we were missing something. It was time for your fourth child. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> uh, maybe. Maybe you're right. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, at that time, I also, there was, I was too minded. 
I had an Erasmus visit to the Royal Institute of Technology in, in Sweden, TTH. And they made two presentations, one calling crossroads of a group, of a, a group test debug penability and our fault injection. I had two PhD students, they were finished their PhD works at that time. So they were, there was work on that and this, we were getting good, good results on the microelectronics. And I was talking about the personal path in remote experimentation because at that time I had, you have to see, I, I entered this because of, you know, I, I told you the decision and I said, is this what I want to do? What do I want to do? Um, I think we all get these kind of things in our life. Sometimes we don't know. Left or right? <laughs> There's no middle? No. Left or right? Two thousand and ten. Slowly going into the right direction. I had missing, and so I missed two revs here. I missed the rev two thousand and eight, that was in um, uh, Dusseldorf, toward the, organized by Heinar Langman. I missed the the rev of two thousand and nine, that was in Bridgeport in the USA. It was uh, organized by Tarek So. But then, Ricardo, that joined my, my institution, the Polytechnic, said, I want to do a PhD. And I want to do a PhD in the scope of my master's in remote labs. I said, okay, let's do it. Then there was a, a, a position for a, a professor at my institution, so this will be the, the highest level. And I ran for it. I've been running for that for a long time. Um, and when you do, when you run for a position, you have to present your CV and you have to present a license. So that was my lesson. Infrastructures for teaching, learning, lab competence, applications, case in electrical engineering. The head of school was the, the president, so the head of the jury. And uh, I didn't got the position, but at the end of the, this um, kind of contest, I don't know, this, you know, there were 10 people running for it. He said, how much money do you want? And I said, mm, for doing what? I want to involve the guys from the physics department. You have to increase the... Learning. And I said, mm, give me 150,000 euros and I'll do what you want. And he gave me the money. <laughs> so it was not that bad. That's not a bad second prize. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not that bad. I, I mean, you're right. It was not that bad. Anyway, so... Physics Lab Forum started in April 2010 and it went to October 2012. And I was working then with Maria Selina Marx from the physics department. And we really get along, you know, doing things, doing stuff. And the idea was, okay, three phases, three phases. First one, buy a vizier system. Immediately start using remote experiments in the physics courses. This is a, you buy it, you put it, it's done. So it took something like two or three months. We had people coming from uh, BTH to install the, the software. Uh, Christian Nielsen and Johan Zakrisen. And then Ingvar came to actually officially inaugurate, you know, open the, the remote lab. And we started using that. Second phase. We had some remote labs on electronics called Remote Elect Lab. And we wanted to tune it to special needs or, or special requests from different teachers. Because we had different teachers using it. And we wanted to be able to address your particular request, your particular request. And the third phase, develop remote labs from the scratch in physics. Like, for instance, a project launch, you know, experiment. At that point, I also went to Salamanca to present the same lesson in Erasmus visit. Uh, why I went to Salamanca? Because Salamanca is midway between Porto and Madrid, and I went to Madrid to see the comms, so I tried to put everything. I took my car, I went there, I give this lesson there. Later on, they invite me to join the project, and we got this project, and that's where I got the money to be here right now. It's in a project on informal learning competence. How do you tag these kind of activities? Okay? 
and slowly things were getting to the right direction. I went to REV in Stockholm and it was in October 2010 that I submitted a, a, an application to organize REV 2014. So I had my ideas. This is the way I want to go. I, the decision was made. And when you make a decision, you know, it's like all that energy, you know, comes to your back and say, wow, let's go. Portuguese guys, let's go into Japan in a boat. And we went into a boat. You know, it's the way you feel this, this kind of things. When you are too minded, you know, you, you don't know if you are doing the right thing, he says. So, okay. Physics lab form. This is the project that you guys have here involve different departments, physics, chemistry, civil, mechanical, you know. Here you have the different faculties. We were running workshops. What do you want? What is remote labs to you? How do you want to use this? You know, remote labs getting into the daily teaching life of the faculty, you know. And we were measuring the, res the educational results that students had. I had some presentations that I can really show you that there is an, an advantage if you use remote labs. And we have been able to measure that. Okay? It's not that, no. But it's the slightly difference from there to there. And some people say, I wouldn't mind investing $10 million if I can increase the success rate of students in mass from 10% to 12%. That's worse. That's worse than money. From 10 to 12. I said, just that? Yeah. But that's the difference. You know? So we were actually doing this kind of, of work. And studies of things kept going. The travel proposal with the University of Salamanca was accepted. I went to Educom in Amman, Jordan. By this time, there was a big, you know, buzzing because the European Commission was about to open a program for funding a federation of remote labs. Top price, 10 million euros. So everybody in the remote labs community was crazy about this. And everybody was doing proposals. We also, we did one. There was a kind of division. Dennis Gillet, that was the keynote in, in REV, he emerged with uh, Tom De Jong, which is a guy from the Inquired Basic Learning at the University of Tente. He got the prize. By this time, I also started editing a book with Javier, using remote labs in education, two little ducks in remote experimentation. There was a REV in Brasov. <coughs> By this time, because I had this connection with the, the, the university in Spain and in Latin America, I started to learn Spanish. I went three years to learn Spanish. So eventually, I got my first keynote in Spanish. There was this conference organized by Teresa Restivo in, uh, in, in Portugal. <coughs> and so, 2012, physics lab, oh, sorry. Educom in Marrakesh. By that time, I made an application to organize the first conference, the international conference of the Portuguese Society for Engineering Education. I was in the examination board of UNAIS, a student of Javier, and this was in Spanish too. There was a rev organized by Javier. Carissa Bowles, which is considered one of the pioneers in remote labs, her paper that was published at the IEEE Transactions and Education called Distance, uh, distance Learning applica app, uh, Applied to control, to control Engineering is one of the most cited papers in our area. We got the best demo award for one of the results of the, the physics software project 
flexible online apparatus for project launch experience. And it was by them that I got the news from Michael that our application to organize REV 2040 was accepted. I want to it's a personal invitation to, to go there. Okay. <coughs> Just so that, over that time, has have you been asking the same research questions, or along with your history, is there like a progression of different questions? And what's your current question, the big question? I don't know if there is only one question. Hmm. Um, I will be suspicious if there will be just one question. And I'll tell you why. In my view, remote labs, remote engineering is clearly an interdisciplinary field. You have telemedicine, you have the pedagogy of remote labs, you have the remote labs used through virtual worlds, so, different communities will have different questions. There's no, I, I don't see one, the only grail, the only question of uh, remote labs. I don't see that way. I see a lot of questions still to be answered. But I see, when we were doing that proposals, one of the things that I noticed is that there is a different language between people who work in psychology, education, arts, and engineers. It's a difficult dialogue. It's a very difficult dialogue. And I was not getting that kind of, you know, how do you say, sensibility, you know, to how these people think, how they see things. But I think slowly through the years, I started to, to get a bit more of that, you know, competence in actually, okay, I understand your view. Let's put it that way, you know. Actually, that, that proposal, the ITELI proposal that we submitted was on the use of remote labs, Federation of Remote Labs, for engaging youngsters into STEAM education, science, technology, engineering, and maths. And we had people like Maggie Saban Baden from Coventry, she's from the Inquirer, Basic learn problem solving learning, and I see we did a. There was huge work in there, but I really grew in the sense that I started to understand, and I started to become more fluent on the way you combine the different sensibilities, different expertise, different backgrounds. The gender question that you brought to my mind, and it, I thank you for that because it's also important there. So answering your question. No, I don't think there's one question. I think there are several questions. And several questions because there are different views on what remote labs is and how they can be used in education. Faisal, um, so, yeah, Faisal and Rosa, they have this paper on the learning outcomes of uh, the learning contents that you acquire, the, the contents you acquire with labs, laboratories. And they have this taxonomy where they listed 13 objectives for labs, and they also divide labs into three categories. Labs for education, labs for development, labs for research. So this will, there will be different goals for according to how do you use the lab. Um, so there's a lot of things in that sense, okay? Um, and I think the community is addressing that same uh, that, that sort of question, if you, you were in REV and you saw that there are still the technical questions, how do we share labs, how do we federate this uh, IT things, software things, rigs, all that stuff, there is this technical, you know, there is the educational and you saw a lot of papers on that and also the, the workshop by George and uh, it's Georgie, the workshop that was yeah, run by George, you, uh, yeah. From yeah. George Banky. Yeah. You, you were there? Yeah. So, you see, you get all these different perspectives. Okay? So, 
that's good because that means that the community is alive and the questions are there and you 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 really you, you really have things happening. Two thousand and thirteen, right? The Galk making Galk is another initiative, you know, about the Global Online Laboratory Consortium. I was also invited to be at this workshop, Love is Sharing, where I presented the Vizio Special Interest Group. And my visit to your institution, which I thank thank you for being here. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. My conclusion, less, maybe more. When you do less things, I think, remember I had these two routes in parallel. I was doing a lot of things. But now I'm more focused on remote labs. And in that sense, I think, well, we have lost that. You lost that. No, I didn't lose that. I, bring many, I brought many things from that area into remote labs. Today we were having this um, kind of brainstorming in a wonderful place where you can see the boundaries of Toowoomba. Picnic point, please. Yeah. Lovely. That model that I've shown to you, you know, with the, the circles and the one in the middle, that model I use in, on my PhD thesis. And actually it is the way you use operations for debugging electronic systems. You do single step, breakpoints, and real time analysis, and you state observation operations. Who is an electrical engineer knows this? Because with single steps, you break the time. Do one operation, reflect upon the, the operations that are done, okay, you do another step, you change the state of the system. You are using time in a certain manner. When you go to breakpoints, you let the time go in its natural way till you reach that point. Then you are looking for that particular condition. But you are still stopping time. The hard part of debug is when you go to real time analysis, because then you cannot control time. But from these three elements, you get to diagnose the problem. That's the center part. So you can actually bring things from one field into another one. You can do that. The well, one worry I've got about remote labs is how do you ensure that your remote lab gives the student a better experience than a really good simulation? How do you make sure that the remote lab really <coughs> is extra to putting a good simulation for them to play with. Yeah, it's... That's one of the holy grails. Like, if you're going to get holy grails... So we just before we start the discussion, we'll just formally thank you and uh, conclude uh, just, the just, yeah, Thank you. And can you people if they want to make a time with Gustavo? I'm, I'm happy to sit down. Just day. don't forget these covers that are organizing, okay? I, I'm leaving... The, I left the, the leaflets with Lee yeah. Brody. And of course, come to Rev. I'll be happy to welcome you in Porto. It's a wonderful place, okay? One thing to be careful of, salt herring. <laughs> when I was at the conference in, uh, in Portugal, <laughs> salt herring got to Rev. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> port wine. But answer your question. Yeah. I, you, you're right. One of the things that we were discussing today, and I said this to, to Lindy, that I would like to organize a, a panel in the REF conference with two persons. One will be you and Linson. You know? You and Lindsay. Yeah. Be why? Because this person believes that remote labs are useful, they are important, and he's on it. And the other will be Lyle Faisal, the guy that worked up about this la laboratory learning outcomes. Why? Because he thinks that simulation is everything you need. So I would love to put them together. <coughs> and making that particular question, mm. because I don't know the answer, but I know that from the discussion between these two guys, maybe some light will come into that. Because it's, it's really that. Some people, let's say, with simulation, and particularly with electronics and electrical things, you can get everything. But the funny thing, um, you get this Vizir. We, we published a paper about Vizir, and once I told the Ingvar, Ingvar, this is not working correctly, What's wrong? I'm measuring the DC value of a pure sine wave. What is the DC value of a pure DC, uh, of a pure sine wave? Not the 
No, no, it's the DC value. You know? I'm an electrical person. No, it's, it's, it's zero. Well, if it sits on zero, it's it could a, be a sine wave. No, no, it's a pure it's sine wave. It's a pure oh, okay. sine wave. Pure. And I was got, getting different different readings. I said, what's this? Inbar, this is not working. Actually, it's the way the, the interface is made. Because they are using the, the VI panels to access the real instrument. And they opt for a resolution of three and a, uh, and a half digits. And on that resolution, it takes the instant value when we are doing DC values, reading DC readings and AC values. If you turn out to five and a half, it will get the real DC value. But then you will have more time to access the remote lab. So he made this choice, but he, he didn't actually solve the consequence of it. And when I tried to use the instrument in a real way, as I would do in the lab, I spotted the problem. Will you do, will you actually understand that if you just use stimulation? Well, I, I have the line that an experiment that does exactly what you thought it would teaches you nothing. It's an experiment that goes wrong. The people measuring the velocity of light and getting the wrong answers, the, all, all these things that teach you something. But when you design a remote lab, can you make sure that the unexpected can get through to the student? Or do you design your channels of communication around just what you expect? I'll give you by heart one sentence that was on the call for proposals of that, of, of that program that, uh, that Dennis got the, the project. The remote labs should allow students to learn from errors. Hmm. It's there. Yeah. So this is an open call for projects. So what you are saying is that it is important. It's actually there. You are right. But, but if you're dealing with a simulation, it's you can really blow something up. Their, their screen can explode in colour if they've done the wrong thing, but you don't really want that to happen in the laboratory. Yeah. But you see, what the Ingvar says, and I, see, I, I agree with him, experimentation is a dialogue with nature. Mm. He, when I was young, and this is the words of Ingvar, I've done a lot of experiments. Students nowadays, they don't do too many experiments. They've lost this. And the tricky part, when you do a dialogue of the, with the nature, is not understanding the, the, the answer. It's what is the best question to make? What questions do I make to nature to really understand things? Can you actually feel this if you are interacting with a simulation that you know that everything has been programmed in advance? You I seem to say a really well designed simulation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But will that programmer or that thousands of programmers but I wonder about the remote lab. replace nature? But will the remote lab convey enough of nature? I think when so. When you knew what the signals were that you were going to be sending uh, it, It's the nature that's on the other side. That's the beauty of remote labs. It's the nature on the other side. It's not the model. You are inter You are being computer. That's computer mediated reality. That's for sure. Right. Correct. But there are things that only when you are accessing the real apparatus, the real experiments, you will understand. Now, that's another thing on research, is that higher order experimental skills. There is this contest, you know, where you have two people sitting. All right. And on the other side of the bench, there is a, one person and one algorithm developed with artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Every year they repeat this test to see how long do these two people can say, what's in front of me, it's for sure a person. The yeah. Can you actually get the same test with a simulation engine and a remote lab? And having these two, this is a model. This is the real thing. And you see the trick is not understanding the answers, but what questions shall I make 
to really see if the answer tells me if it is this or that. If you have students developed in this kind of exper ex expertise, they are really up to the language of nature. They will be good engineers. They, because they will understand that. I tend to make some experiments with my students. For instance, I take, you know, you know a copper, a copper tube, tube made of copper, and I have a magnet. And one of the things I do in a, in a class is I take the magnet and I play with this. This is the magnet. Come on. You know, and because of, you know, the effect that you have one uh, as a changing magnet field in the copper, you have uh, the inducive currents that will... And it will be like this. Yeah. And then I have a very similar piece made of aluminium. And when the student, come on, you try this. And I give them the aluminium. <laughs> and they start, okay, you do the same way. And they try. <laughs> with this just to perceive you know to because when you create such a kind of mo you know amusing things they will recall that they will learn because that's something that was funny you know they were intrigued how the hell does he do that you know and that's the sort of things that you, you, you I think we need to teach is to engage people into science technology because we need that we, we rely every day our society relies every day more on technology if there's no people su to sustain this to really understand and the, understand the impact that technology has in nature you know the side effects pollution all that stuff I don't know where we'll end up so you really want to make sure for the benefits of all that people understand that technology it's a dialogue. We, we do things with nature. So I think remote labs can be a way to, in that it's a, it's a it's a, a step on that direction because you interact with real things. The best way to do it, I don't know. I, I, I'm on it. I, I want to to know more, learn more, come here, you know. Because I don't have the answer. But eventually, we'll get there. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your questions. That's all appeal, though, isn't it, of science and nature? That yeah. There's not one answer. Yeah. It, it will always differ. Do you have any other questions at this stage? All right. Maybe you have a five-minute break or something before we... Okay. Informal chat or something. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hope I haven't been boring with you. I, I, sometimes I tend to speak too much. No. <laughs> That's all fine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.